Okay. Well, hello everyone and welcome. I'm Kim Schneider Malik and I'm one of the co-chairs of the Parents Council. And I am based in Denver, Colorado. And um, I am the mom of three BBYO thriving, flourishing uh, kids who, two who are high schoolers, Jacob and Henry, and they're on their regional board in the Rocky Mountain region. And Molly, who's a freshman at school in North Carolina and went all four years through, all five years through BBYO and um, is now finding her feet in a new state uh, with BB BBYO Connections. So I'll turn it over to my co-chair, Stacy Marlowe. Hi, good evening. I'm Stacy Marlowe. I'm based in Scarsdale, New York. I am also the parent of three uh, BBYOers, uh, Hudson Valley region, Lauren and Maddie, who are alum. They are freshmen. Lauren is at Wash U and Maddie is at Syracuse and Taylor is an active member of the Eden chapter. I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. The last week and a half have been some of the toughest times we have experienced as a community. We are all grieving in different ways and experiencing fear, sadness, and anxiety. We have never seen this unbridled hate and vitriol to us as Jews. News is coming in daily and at a fast pace. It's hard to turn away. Tonight, we hope we can offer some words of comfort can provide you some tools when talking to your teens. Thank you. And we are gonna turn it over to um, Drew and Dr. G. Um, I will, give me one second. Uh, tonight, our conversation will be moderated by Drew Fiddler, BBYO Senior Director for Center, the Center of Adolescent Wellness. She and our speaker, Dr. G, will discuss ways to talk about your to talk to your teen about the attacks and war in Israel, what they are thinking, how they are feeling, and what they may be seeing on social media. Dr. Deborah Gilboa, popularly known as Dr. G, is a resiliency expert who teaches individuals, teams, and companies some of the most valuable skills they need to learn how to transform fear, stress, and anxiety into resilience, productivity, and innovation. Dr. G is a popular TV guest and a board-certified family physician who frequently appears on top television programs, including Today, Good Morning America, and The Doctors. She is also a contributor to The Washington Post, The New York Times, Huffington Post, Forbes, and other print and digital outlets. And Dr. G is also the author of five self-development books, which include From Stress to Resilient, The Guide to Handle More and Feel It Less. Now I'm going to pass it over to Drew and Dr. G. Thanks so much, Carly. Hi, Dr. G. Hi. How's your week been going? You know, it's it's been been quiet around here. I don't know. Nothing major. Nothing major. Um, I want to thank you first for for taking the time to be with us, to be with all of our parents at what is a difficult time for for everyone. And I think you know this this moment, right? And and what is happening for many of our teens and our families? It's not a war happening somewhere else. They are intimately tied to the people there. They have friends or family that maybe live there or are serving in the IDF. They have maybe former camp counselors or shlichim or, you know, they've lost people. They can't attend funerals. They're grieving. I think this is just, it's such a different, um, such a different piece than what we have encountered before. And I think for many parents, it leaves us wondering, not only how do we help ourselves, right? I think for all of us, we are feeling maybe a little lost, maybe a little bit without a compass of how do I help my kid and how do I help myself right now? Um, and so, you know, would just love to hear from you, any thoughts you have on, you know, how do we manage the sad, the anxious, the angry, um, both as parents? How do we, how do we do it for ourselves? And also, how do we help our our kids navigate these emotions in a safe, healthy, and supportive way? Starting off small, you know. Great. Okay. 
So <laughs> a softball to start out with. Uh, listen, I'm really honored to join you. This is really important. I'm the mom of four. Uh, my boys are 15, 17, 19, and 21. So I'm right in this. This is my sweet spot too. And I think you asked the right question first. How do we handle how we're feeling ourselves? And listen, we do a lot as parents where we sort of ignore how we're feeling and just move forward. Imagine all the times you've taken care of your sick kid while you were also sick from the exact same bug and you sort of focused on them being sick. But there's a couple of differences. And one is our kids are watching how we handle this to see how they should handle it both now and as adults. Uh, and I am very much afraid that this is not a six day experience, right? We, I, I don't know about you, my experience of growing up in America, learning about Israeli history and loving a lot of people in Israel. Um, I went to see the movie Golda just a few weeks ago and it's a great deal about the Yom Kippur war. And when they said, you know, in a few weeks later, I was like, weeks, that thing went on for weeks? Gosh, that seems so long. You know, this may be a little while. And so we can't just hold our breath, grit our teeth and try and get through for a few days. We got to figure out how to, in the words of my, my mom, begin as we mean to go on with this. I saw this thing online that said, um, that a woman had posted that said, a non-Jewish friend at work asked me if I had any family in Israel and I didn't understand the question. And I said, yeah, everyone. And they didn't understand my answer. Mm. And I, I think that that is some of what is different for us than this. I have friends and coworkers who were very worried for family and friends in Ukraine. And that fear is no less important, no less present, no less difficult. But it is somehow different. You're right. You know, there's, there's so many ties. And BBYO and camps and all the different ex um, experiences that our kids do, it makes them care. And like Kim and Stacey, I don't know how you feel about this, but I um, I, I spent my kids all growing up years being like, oh, I should send them to this. It has great Israel programming. And this preschool has, they do an Israel day thing and the day camp, I hope the Jewish community center, whatever, I hope they do an Israel day. And oh, look, there are shlichim and shinshinim from Israel there. And they'll teach my kids about Israel. So now my kids really care about Israel and they care very much about what's going on there. And that was the idea. And now we're really seeing how that is when things are very scary there. So the first thing that I want to say is it is totally reasonable for our kids to see that we are emotionally affected by this. As a matter of fact, they really value our authenticity. And if we tried to pretend that we weren't impacted by this, we would lose all our credibility because they'd know we were pretending. And we don't want them to pretend, right? We want to know how they're really feeling, or we want them to at least be able to honestly say, hey, I'm not sure, or hey, I'm not ready to talk about it right now, but we don't want them to try and pretend with us. And so pretending with them is not useful or ethical, doesn't, doesn't have integrity. That said, we can't fall apart on our kids on a regular basis. We still have to be somebody who can carry our own load and support them, which means, we got to have other people, grown up people that we talk to about what's going on with us so that we can we can express our emotions around our kids. It's the difference between expressing your emotions and saying, these are my emotions. And sometimes I even have to sit down. They're so heavy and saying, these are my emotions and I need you to carry them for me because I can't carry them anymore. Does that analogy make sense? Yeah. And I think, I mean, it's right. We still have to be the coach. Yeah. Right. We're still, we are still with teenagers, so much of the coach and helping to guide and support the and consultant, right? Right. Like, not the manager anymore, but the consultant. <laughs> yeah. Um, and as we look at that piece of the consultant, how do we help our kids navigate these really big emotions without okay. being worried that that something's wrong or, you know, forcing them to sort of be okay or hold it in? You did not just ask me how to make Jewish parents not worry. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. 
I mean, to be a realistic question. No, listen, I think the most, the three most useless words in any language strung together in a sentence are don't worry, mom, you know? So, but what I'll say is this, and this might be surprising or uncomfortable. I want you to notice your kids' emotions. I want you to think about and ask them what might help support them. I don't want you to be afraid of your kids' emotions. And if you are listening to this and you're saying, oh, you don't understand. My kid's mental health is too fragile right now for me to not be worried or scared of their big emotions. Then I would say to you, hey, absolutely. If your child, and let, I'm gonna make, and we may do this a few times tonight. I'm gonna make a, um, a, a I'm gonna compare to the pandemic. So if during the pandemic, you were to have said to me, and I'm a family doctor, I'm an MD. So I see a lot of kids and a lot of grownups in my practice. I'm at a federally qualified health center. I see all kinds of folks who are underserved. And if you were to say to me, hey, I, I have to worry about them catching COVID. They're medically fragile. They have you know, very bad asthma or something else where they could get very sick very quickly. Then I would say, oh yeah, I want you to be in touch with their doc. I want you to get special um, support. I want them to get special support. I want you both to know what to look for and what to do if you see those things. And in the exact same way, I'm gonna say, if you're dealing with someone who is in the 18% of people, teens and adults, who have chronic mental illness, please be talking to your teenager or your young adult child about which of their support team they're talking to about this and what they should be looking for and what you should be looking for. So that's real. For the 82% of people who are just dealing with, and I say just kind of in air quotes, terrible mental distress about this, one of the best things we can do for our kids is know that they can experience big, hard emotions and figure it out. Of course, you're going to keep an eye on them. You can have no medical risk factors and get COVID and become very ill. And you can have no mental health risk factors and be really seriously impacted by this and become very overwhelmed very quickly, for sure. But you're never going to not look at your kid and see how you think they're doing. And I think one of the things that might be helpful for us to talk about is what do you say to your kid when you're worried and they tell you not to worry? Yeah. What does that look like? What do I, how do I right. have that conversation? But the first thing that I want to say is the best, most useful and evidence-based way that we can help our kids through big emotions is by not trying to fix those emotions. So Drew, I promise to answer that question about what do you do when you're worried and they tell you not to worry. But first I want to say, we have this big myth in our society that if you're a decent person, expressing empathy should come easily to you. And that's not true. I won't go into all of them, but there are seven cognitive barriers to effectively expressing empathy. And not one of them is if you're a good person or not. Okay. And one of the biggest cognitive barriers to expressing empathy is when you feel impacted by that person's emotions. So in our families, that happens all the time. Your kid has big emotions and you feel them almost with them. Sometimes we were taught, and I'm, I'm going to look at parents who are my age, you know, in our, in our late forties, early fifties, we were taught actually that good empathy meant mirroring someone's emotions. That Jordan, if you were crying for me to show empathy, I would have to sit down next to you and cry too. And that turns out to not be empathy. As a matter of fact, adults, you probably all have somebody in your life where you hesitate to tell them when you're really upset about something because they get just as upset or more upset than you do. Don't be that person for your kids. <laughs> At least not emoting to them. Oh, that's terrible. And I'm going to, now I hate that person and I hate them for you. And they're dead to me. Like that doesn't help our kids. Coaching, just like you said, you're coaching our kids and saying, wow, I really want to hear how you feel. That's really hard. I love you. So I care about what you're going through. That one phrase, I love you. So I care about what you're experiencing. Or, I care about your emotions. I care about what you're going through. That one idea that handles it even when you just want to fix it for them or tell them to feel a different way. That's a big cognitive barrier when we want to say, oh, there's nothing to be scared of or you shouldn't be angry. All we're showing is that we're afraid of their emotions. And what they hear is your emotions are stupid. You should have different ones. It's, it's easy to see how that's not empathy. Right? Even if we have it the best of intentions, it's not as scary as you think. 
no, 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 they're okay right now. Now you're, you, you should be grateful that this, or we should be happy that that, or uh, you shouldn't be so angry. All that that comes across as is I can only accept some of your emotions. I tell my kids a lot, your feelings are yours. Your behaviors are co-owned here. <laughs> like, when they were little, I used to say your behaviors are mine. They're too old for that ridiculousness now. It worked really well when they were like six. But your feelings are 100% yours. Whatever you say they are, they are. That's just true. How you behave, whether or not you go to school, your attitude, the way you speak to your sister, whether you do the things that I need you to do around the house, whether you step up to your obligations, those are co-owned. Those are your behaviors, your attitude. But your feelings are 100% yours. And when our kids of any age I was talking to a woman today who was saying that her 27-year-old daughters, she has two of them, um, it seems to be this thing, twins, and that her 27-year-old daughters were calling her and like wanted to tell her about all the things that they were scared of. And she said, and like, I don't know how to assure them that it's going to be okay. And I said, remember when your kids are little, and Drew, you have little ones, right? I do. Yep. I got a one and a half and a five and a half. So your five and a half year old may well collect rocks or sticks or whatever at a playground and then want to play and be like, will you hold these for me? And you're like, really? Rocks and sticks? Maybe I'm just telling out my own kids, but they want you to hold nope. it for them, right? Yep. Often our kids just want us to hold their emotions with them or for them a little bit so that they can then go back to work or get back on the school bus or play the game. And we hear them telling us about their emotions as a request or a demand to fix things, to tell them how to feel better. Our teenagers, they're smarter than that. They don't think we can fix this, but they do want to know that we can hold, not for them, but with them and accept whatever their emotions are. Right. They want us to be the emotional trash can in so many ways, right? Like we need to be able to be the receptacle to hold it. And yeah. then also- <laughs> sometimes to be in the foxhole and say it. This right, sucks. exactly. Right. And I think that as they get older, it becomes less hold it for me and more hold it with me. Do my emotions scare you? Because my emotions scare me as a teenager, especially their brain chemicals are heightening all of their emotions and it seems impossible to hold. So if my kid comes to me and says, I hate this and I'm having all these feelings, I want this these people to die, or I want this to never be like this, or I never want to do these things, or I always want to do these things. And those feelings are scaring me, whether I say it or not, I have all this anger or shame, or, you know, I, I, I feel ashamed to be Jewish. And if we don't react in shock, if we react with, oh, those are big feelings. That's hard. I love you. I care about what you're feeling. Then they go, okay, maybe these aren't quite as awful, shameful, impossible to hold as I thought they were. How do we, I guess, and not to cut you off mid-thought, if I am, please feel free to jump in, but how do we do that when it's happening also, you know, what our kids are experiencing, A, is so personal, and B, the things that are happening online or in school are making them feel like, the people that were their friends aren't their friends or they're isolated or they don't have support or, you know, for the first time they're, they're feeling some very real anti-Semitism that they haven't before. How do we, you know, as a parent, your instinct is to jump in. You want to protect, you want to save. How do we navigate that when, you know, we know that our kids are really experiencing something, um, and, and possibly going through these this real heartbreak of losing friends or wanting to speak up and speak out and, and not knowing how to do that. So the 2% of the times that our kids are genuinely at risk, whether mental health, like I talked about, like you're like, hey, I think that this might be putting you in a space that is actually dangerous to you or physically at risk then as a parent, it is our job to jump in and protect them with our bodies and our voices and our actions. But 98% of the time, that's not what's happening. It is heartbreaking. It is terrifying. One of the hardest parts of our job as a parent is to differentiate between tremendous discomfort and actual danger. And 
when it's actual danger, jump in. Model for your kids through action, through speaking up, through protecting them. But when it is just almost unbearable discomfort, the heartbreak, the fear, the anger, the shame, the best thing we can do for our kids is to stand either beside them or just behind them, believing in their ability to handle this terrible, terrible discomfort. Not alone, but believing that they can live through this. And we know that they will. Right? It is awful. And I, I am so sorry that it turns out that my personal lens is that Jewish people and the Jewish community are really very marginalized right now. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I want us to remember is what we are teaching our kids is how strong they are. We're teaching them how to handle anti-Semitism that happens when they're 50 and their kids are this age or they're at work. And we're gonna talk about some specific things that we can help our college students do now. But what we're showing them is we believe and we're standing right there with them caring. We're not saying like, oh, I think you'll be okay and leaving the room metaphorically, but we're saying this is awful and, not but, this is awful and you can stand this. And, and then based on your own family's values and culture, what do you do? Right? Do you watch Gilmore Girls together? Do you join a social action thing? Do you, you know, whatever you do, Judaism teaches us you aren't what happens to you. You are who you are in the face of what happens to you. And I don't want us to rob our kids of the opportunity to start to figure out who they are in the face of anti Semitism or in the face of tremendous love and fear for friends or family who are in danger. I think that's such a beautiful way of looking at it. Um, you know, that like- Way easier said than done. <laughs> yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. But that, totally. you know, you and I have had this conversation many times about like where resilience comes from, right? And it is through these incredibly hard moments that we see people grow. Um, and our kids more more than anyone. I mean, yes, there were so many impacts of COVID and we saw our kids truly grow as well and, and learn different skills and learn different things they didn't know before. Um, what if- Just on that, Drew, I just want yeah. to point out, I bet that a lot of people who are with us tonight can think of the first time in their lives they ever experienced anti-Semitism and probably their parents weren't noticing. They may have been able to go home and talk about it and they may not have, but it might've been at a first job or it might've been over at someone's house. And, and, and I don't mean to just project, I'm thinking of other people's stories here, not just my own, but we maybe didn't know how we were supposed to handle it or feel about it or what was going on. And like the pandemic, which was awful, but was the first time we've ever had a pandemic because we've had others where adults were watching kids to see how they were doing and supporting them. We are aligning with our kids to see how they're doing, both the, the kids still in our homes and the kids out of our homes to see how they're doing and standing next to them and supporting them. And that will strengthen them now and in the future. Yeah. I think that's, it's an important, right? It's, it is awful that our kids have to live through this and it is an important piece of, we can't of who the they world. become. We can't change it. Can't fix as the world. There's much this whole thing that to. says like, it's easier to wear slippers than to carpet the world. We can't get out there and carpet the whole world for our kids. Right. I'm not saying you can't go you know, to your kid's school with your young adult child's permission to their university and be like, hey, what the actual heck is going on here? Right? Because let's face it, at a lot of our kids' universities, we are the customer, not our kids, unless they're writing their own check for, mm -hmm. you know, for their education. But- partner with your kids, make sure that you're talking together about the impact, the possible positive impact, the possible fallout, and, and that we're modeling. 
I think it's pretty clear to me that we're not going to solve this, this generation. So they're going to have to deal with this in the future. Yeah. Um, and I just want to say, I know we have a few people with their hands raised. Please feel free to drop um, any questions you have. You can chat them at hosts and panelists. Um, we would love to collect your questions as Dr. G and I continue to move forward uh, with the conversation. And I skipped a really important question of yours and I promised I would come back to it, but I bet oh, a lot yeah. of question, which is, what do you do when you're worried about your kid and how they're doing with this? And they tell you I'm fine or it's nothing or, you know, some other sort of blow you off answer. And what I want to say is, first of all, you do good by showing that you care about it. You don't do good by nagging, right? You don't do, you're not a force for good in anybody's life by nagging, especially in your own, but it is always okay to notice out loud using, remember these, I statements. I've noticed that you're eating less. I've noticed that you seem quieter. Um, it seems to me that, and if your kid is like, no, I'm fine. Hey, could you stop? I don't wanna talk about it. Then what I would suggest is that you keep an eye for a day or two, unless you see something that you say, this seems dangerous to me. You know, you've gone into your room, you didn't come out for 23 hours. <laughs> so if that's not normal, then you say, hey, this behavior isn't normal. It really concerns me. When your kids were littler, if they had um, a stomach ache and they were eating less than normal, but they didn't want to go to the doctor about it and they wanted to minimize it, if you were really worried, you'd take them to the doctor and you'd say, I'm really sorry. I understand that you think this, but it's my job. Your health is, you know, your safety and your health is my responsibility. And yeah, I might be wrong. I would love to be wrong, but I can't risk it. But there's a step between I'm worried about you and you're telling me everything's fine. And now we're going to see a, a healthcare professional of some kind. And that is for our teenage kids, especially kids involved in BBYO, you have other adults who are cued into your kids, like them, enjoy them and know them somewhat. So if you really do think there's something wrong and your kid is telling you there isn't, ask another adult who you and your child trust, ask their opinion, get a second opinion. You know, whether that's a school counselor, a co-parent, um, a best friend's parent, a youth group advisor, whomever it is, just say, hey, and I did this with one of my kids. It's like, I, I'm asking my 17 year old how he's doing. And he seems to me like he is not doing fine, but his words are, hey, I'm doing fine. Could And so I said to his uncle, this weekend, could you just make sure you, you know, spend a little bit of time with him and give me your take. And you can tell him I sent you. I'm not trying to do this in any sort of hidden way. It's another way of saying to our kids, I'm not going to not care. I might be wrong, but I'm not going to not pay attention or not ask. I love that. And I mean, I statements are such an important piece of the puzzle because it doesn't make them feel put upon, right? It doesn't make them feel like there's something wrong with them. Um, so I wanted to ask, and I think this goes sort of a step further and, and we got a parent question on this also, the images and videos that are out there right now are incredibly traumatic. And unfortunately, you know, I don't think this is it in terms of the images, the videos, right? The, the information that is coming out is incredibly traumatic. It's unverified, it gets posted and it's available immediately. Um, how do we help our kids navigate social media right now? Um, okay. You know, I think it's unrealistic to just take it away, right? Let's be real. Although They're I will teenagers. Say middle schoolers, if you have middle schoolers that you're thinking about, I know we're here mostly talking about high schoolers and older, but if you have middle schoolers that you're thinking about, this might be the right time to transparently say, hey, these are just not safe things to have on your phone or on your device. That's up to you and the culture of your home and what is normal in your interactions with your kids. But here's something that I think is always valuable. And it's a great entry point for the conversation. If you're here tonight listening to all this because you're really worried about what's going on, but your kids don't seem that engaged with it or you're not talking about it, a great entry point is always to ask an earnest question. Not a question where you're looking for the right answer, but an earnest question. So I said to my 17 year old uh, who is on TikTok and Instagram, hey, from your point of view, what are the advantages and disadvantages to watching stuff in your feed right now about what's happening in Israel? And he answered me. And I, I, this is the hard part. We're not listening to, to 
tell our opinion. Like we're not just listening for an excuse to say what we want to say. We're actually trying to be curious. What do you see as the advantages and disadvantages? And it may be that your kid stops you in your tracks with something that's like, I, I feel like I have to bear witness to what's going on. And then you can have an even more nuanced conversation and be like, okay, that is an advantage. Can you tell me about some of the disadvantages? If you have a kid who's really stonewalling you because they think that you're just looking for an excuse to take something away from them or try and put down a limit that they don't want, you might say, what, do you, what kinds of limits do you think we should consider for your younger siblings or for your cousins? What would you say to younger kids in your BBYO chapter about the risks of this? And that gets them thinking critically. One of the things that I ask my kids to consider doing is simply moving their social media apps to a different screen on their phone so they didn't hit it out of habit. And my kids were both totally open to that. They were like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Because I don't know about you, Drew, but I, I'll hit Instagram out of habit. You know, like I'm just sitting waiting for something and I just tap it. And then suddenly I'm seeing something that I personally, 53 years old, was not emotionally prepared for at that moment. And so moving it to a different screen, I just I have to go there on purpose. There are a lot of different ways asking your kids or even brainstorming with them being like, I'm feeling overwhelmed by all the content I'm seeing. I think there's a thing on our phones where we can put on a limit so that it, it gives us a, hey, you've been on this for a certain amount of time kind of pop up. Can you right, help me figure right. out how to do that on my phone? Is that something you'd ever do on your phone? So in some ways, helping them to navigate, right, that technology in a more thoughtful way, helping them to sort of, yeah. It makes a big difference. Asking them if you see signs in them that they're getting less sleep than usual, saying, can you tell me about your sleep? Has that changed for you? How you doing? Our -hmm. kids can tell from our tone of voice if we're looking for an excuse to get them in trouble or if we're trying really to be curious and have a conversation with them. This, by the way, might just be a time where at your house, like at my house, nobody's sleeping that great. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, a lot of parents are worried, you know, do, do we have our kids report? Do we, do they engage on social media, right? Do they disengage if, if they're seeing people posting harmful anti-Semitic things, if they're, you know, receiving bullying or seeing things happen on this platform um you know i do they engage do they not engage how how can we help to guide them in that place i think is something parents are are worried about for sure and i'm going to say that it's going to end up being their decision but we can be that consultant we can ask questions and say, who do you want to be in the face of this anti-Semitism? And if they say, I want to be somebody that reports every post and argues with everybody, then it's a conversation about bandwidth and it's a conversation about energy. And it's a question, it's a conversation about where can you have the most impact without grinding yourself to shreds. And if it's, well, nobody would listen to me anyway, and I don't even want to be Jewish anymore then it's a different conversation. Remembering that their feelings, whatever they are, you can take it. Their behavior, if they are posting things that, you know, that are like their younger siblings are seeing and are harmful and whatever, you can have a conversation about behavior, but first feelings. If you can start off with empathy and curiosity and gratitude, we often, and I know this is a medical term, but we can often defibrillate our teenagers' moods by showing gratitude that we're having the conversation. And they're often like, wait, what? If you're like, hey, listen, I just wanna stop you for a second and say, thank you for talking to me about this. And that's it, no, but I need you to do this or I wish you would be like this, just thank you for talking to me about this. And just be quiet for a second. That may change their affect a little bit. When our kids see harmful stuff, It might be traumatic and it might not be traumatic. And I want to talk for just a second about the definition of trauma is something Mm -hmm. that fundamentally changes your sense of safety or your sense of self. Psychologic trauma is something that 
fundamentally alters what you believed about your own self or your own sense of safety. And that's why some kids, a lot of kids, I think, and some adults are experiencing what's happening right now as trauma because they are observing things to be different, fundamentally different than they thought they were from a safety standpoint. And there are some people, and someone put a lovely note in the chat about four grandparents who are Holocaust survivors. For that family, it probably isn't fundamentally changing what they believe about their safety and their sense of self. So it's not to say this is trauma for everyone, but if you are deeply impacted and you're going to talk to a good friend about it or a therapist about it, could you just mention that at dinner? My feelings are getting really big and unmanageable. And so I've started listening to music in the car instead of news. Um, I'm trying really hard to exercise more. I asked your aunt to go for a walk with me this weekend because I just need my people around me a little bit more. Um, I called my therapist and asked for an appointment. Um, what are you doing? You might say to your child, like, these are some things I'm doing. What are you doing? Knowing that if they then say, I'm talking to my friends more, or I think I'm watching a little bit more Netflix or whatever, this is not a moment to judge their coping mechanisms if they're not truly dangerous. It's a question, it's an opportunity to have a conversation about coping mechanisms. Yeah. And do you think that's helpful in some ways? You know, I, I, I saw a lot of questions or a few questions from parents for the kids who don't want to speak up, the kids who aren't engaging, who feel like, you know, they, they don't want to express, you know, we've talked a lot about the kids who are emoting or expressing or talking, but what do you do when you have the kid who doesn't want to engage, doesn't want to talk about it, doesn't want it, right? Like, what does that so I think look like? I, I hear two questions in that, Drew. So one is, what about the kid who is just not willing to discuss it even at home? Doesn't, I saw a question go by about like, my kid wants me to stop watching the news so much, whatever. And I want to say to that, if, if what you're taking in is splashing onto them, right? If you have the news on in the car, if you're watching your Instagram feed when they can hear it and they're like, I really don't want to hear that. I'd ask you to respect that. I would, I would ask you to try to limit the amount of time that you took that in. Um, or if you're just needing to talk about it all the time and your kid's like, I can't, I, I don't want to hear about this, find other people to talk to about it. But if your kid won't talk about it at all, um, I've had a bunch of parents in my 23 years of practice who are like, I want to be the parent that talks to my kids about sex, just for example. And they're all la, 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 la. And what I've said to those parents is there's just some information you need your kids to have. They don't necessarily have to get it from you, but they have to get it from an adult you both trust or a source you both trust. So you might say to your kid, okay, I hear that you don't want to talk much about this. I either need to know you know enough to keep yourself safe or I need some kind of check-in about your mood because I'm worried that you are actually taking in a lot of this and it's really negatively impacting you and that's causing you to shut down. I statements, I'm worried about this. And I've said to my kids this week, I'm more hypervigilant right now about everything, including your mental health and safety. So if you think I'm overreacting, you can tell me that respectfully. And I recognize the fact that I might be overreacting. And also I can't sleep at night if I don't ask you a couple of things. So we're going to do that now. I do want to talk to you for a second, though, about the kids who are in an out of the house, a community setting where they're shutting down. They're not being like, hey, this is anti-Semitism and that's not okay and whatever. I'd really love for us all to talk to our kids about the advantages and disadvantages of speaking up and the advantages and disadvantages of keeping quiet. Not to tell our kids which is the right thing, because I don't know. I'm not an expert in your kids or your family. You are. And you're not an expert in their friends or their school community like they are. And one of the things about our not elementary schoolers anymore is that we have to respect that they may know that setting better than we do. So if you say, gosh, but I want us to be the kind of people who fight against this. One of my kids is at a university that has been totally silent to very anti-Israel, somewhere on that spectrum, you know, and that's like the administration has been totally silent. The student body has been very anti-Israel in this. And I said to him, I think I want you to be more mad than it sounds like you are. 
And he said, cool, I want to be more academically successful and employed than I think Matt is going to get me right now. And that might not be the choice I would make or the choice I want to believe I would make if I was 19 in this setting right now, but it's not my choice. So instead I talked to him about how does that impact you? What kind of support do you need? And before I, so I want to turn to college in a minute because we have a lot of questions about kids on college campuses, kids looking at college campuses. How do we have this conversation? Um, but before that, I want to talk a little bit about, I want to go back to the, you know, you said the quiet to the almost anti-Semitism piece of things. And there are a lot of questions in the chat about, you know, everything from how do we respond to kids asking if we should take down our mezuzahs, right? Indicating that we're Jewish, that we live here to, you know, kids who are scared to speak up in class because their teachers um, are expressing pro-Palestinian thoughts and they are concerned, you know, that, that they're going to be impacted by this or that, you know, there are, kids whose friends are asking them questions that they don't know how to answer, right? right. I think, okay. so, all right. I think all those of are those pieces. Different, <laughs> three different um, aspects of the same question. So one is what about kids who are like, should we be less visibly Jewish, right? Take the mezuzah off our door, the Israeli flag, the Kanukia, whatever it is, um, should we be less visibly Jewish? And then that's a conversation about, and I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer. It is simply a conversation about who do we want to be in the face of this, you know? And if you live in a place that's really hostile or dangerous and you say who we want to be in the face of this is somebody, and I'm thinking of the Sephardic Jews during the Inquisition, who prays in a Catholic church and says the Hebrew prayers under our breath at the end. I'm not judging those people. I hope nobody is judging those people, right? So you are an expert in your situation and the risks to you. And it's not about a right or wrong answer. It is about modeling with your kids and for your kids a conversation about who you've decided to be in the face of this right now. And that could change in two days or a week or a month. How do you handle it if you were to say, I don't wanna take the mezuzah off our door, this is who we are. And you have a kid who's really anxious about that. Then you talk to them about their feelings. You have empathy for their feelings. You ask them in the face of the fact that you're gonna leave your mezuzah up, what else might help them, how, who would they like to talk to about this? What strategies help them when they feel very worried about something that they think could go horribly awry? So that's about like, how are we in our home? How should they be at school? I think the first thing is when they say, I can't speak up, believe them. It might change in 15 minutes after you have a conversation or they might be 100% correct and you totally agree with them or anything in between, but start from a position of believing their expertise in their teacher, their school, their friends, their community, their coach, whatever, and be like, okay, tell me more about that. What happens? Or what have you noticed? Or um, what are you concerned about? Or what are you observing? Treat them like the experts they are while giving them a chance to process and think things through not coming at this from the point of view that there's one right answer and we have to lead our kids to it because I don't, I don't believe there is. And what we're teaching them that's even more important than what they're going to do in that diversity, equity, inclusion club, oh. or in that conversation with a teacher or a coach, we're teaching them a pattern to follow every time they are in a position that feels risky to them. Does that help with that piece of it? Yeah. I think so. I mean, I think it helps us to try and get right to that place. Yeah. Um, I, you are know, you I, I, media or campuses, what do you want to talk about? I, there are so many places I want to go right now. Um, you know, I think I, I think that on the topic of friends and that piece, and then we can pivot to the college campus, right? how really can we help our kids on that? You know, going back to social media for a minute, when they see people responding free Palestine on their posts, when they see, right, like what are some tools or resources 
that they can utilize or that parents can teach them to, to utilize. That I want you to teach your kids is a great tool for them anytime they're in conflict with someone. The first thing that's important for them is to know what they believe, not to be able to express it coherently in a way that somebody else agrees. Just know what they think or what they feel, right? And even if they were never say so, an, an example that's not at all about anti-Semitism is they're at a friend's house and everybody's going to watch a movie and they decide on a scary movie. It isn't, it is a really good start for your child to be able to know whether they say it out loud ever or not. I don't like scary movies. I don't want to watch this. Even if they never speak up and say it, there is emotional value and mental strength value in being able to say to themselves, I don't like scary movies. I don't want, this wouldn't be my choice. What they choose to do about it is the next step, but helping them just say to themselves, not what they're going to post online, not what they're going to argue about with their friends, knowing how they feel themselves. One of the problems that some of our kids are having is they're actually genuinely very, very conflicted because this is a really complicated topic and they haven't studied it their whole lives. And they're not all Middle East experts, even though some of them are at the age where they know absolutely everything about absolutely everything. And so they may be very, very uncomfortable with their own not knowing how they feel. And sometimes we give our kids the idea that if they can express how they feel, we now expect them to go champion that feeling. If they think that the way another kid is being treated is wrong, well, that doesn't matter unless they go stand up for that kid. If they don't like scary movies, well, then they failed unless they say, hey, I don't want to watch this. But actually, it's a very valuable developmental step for people to just know how they actually feel and be able to speak it to themselves. The next step is, in the face of this, who do I want to be? Well, maybe, and I'm going to go back to the scary movie example, maybe I want to be a friend who keeps her mouth shut because it's her best friend's birthday party and they want to watch this movie and I'm just going to watch silly videos on my phone while everybody watches this movie, even though I'm sitting right there on the couch. And every time I catch myself looking up, I'm going to try really hard not to because the kind of person I want to be in this is not somebody who makes a big fuss and makes them pick a different movie at the birthday party. That part is them maneuvering through the world, figuring out how they want to be. Maybe the next time they make a different choice, or maybe they say, Hey, I handled that just fine. I could sit in the room and not be bothered by it and be a supportive friend. I understand that that doesn't translate comfortably or smoothly to oh. fighting anti-Semitism, but first we can help our kids know how they feel. Then we can help our kids find out more about what they want to know. And then the last step is deciding how much they want to then be an ambassador for that knowledge out in the world. But there's a couple of really valuable steps before that. That's what I wanted to express. There are a wealth of amazing resources out there to help people, depending on your kids' preferred social media platform, preferred influencers, all that. Um, my oldest son is fighting in the IDF. He's a combat sharpshooter in a combat unit. And he posted something on his Instagram story and a girl he went to high school with here in Pittsburgh swiped up and said, I'm really disappointed in you for not caring about what's happening to the Palestinians. And he just told me about this in the last few days. And I said, what did you feel? And he told me, and I was like, what do you know? And he told me, and I said, so what did you do? So asking those three questions, what do you feel? What do you know? What do you do? It's a good framework every time our kids are facing something difficult. Because then without the whole long lecture I just gave you about the value of knowing how you feel, you're pointing out to them that each of those steps is valuable. Yeah, I love that. I love the idea of what do you feel? What do you know? And I would almost alter the last one a little bit of what do you want to do, right? right? Like putting yeah, them in the driver's done. seat. Right. He had already done and he's 21 years old. So it's not the same as with my 15 year old who's maybe right. hearing something in high school or in a class or whatever that is like, yeah, what would you want to do? You know, or how right. can I support you? What could you do? What's possible to do? However you might put that. But if you think about it in terms of feel, no, do, and that that's not just to all to lead up to the do, those each of those three steps are valuable at strengthening our kids. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that piece of what do you want to do and giving them the minute to take the beat, 
right? It all comes back to sort of what we talked about at the beginning, which is being that resource, being that support system and letting them know you're available. And you don't have to be the sounding board. I don't think most of us are experts in this situation that's going on right now. I'm trying very, very hard to be an expert because knowledge feels to me like a, a shield in some way, but you don't have to have answers to all your kids' questions about this. A few people have said, I'm trying to stay up to date, but also be there for my kids. And how do I, yeah, I think that that's an ever evolving balance to find. And also, by the way, throw in there, taking care of your own mental health where you can't drink from this fire hose 23 hours a day. So, and you wanna also maybe be involved in certain things and do, and I do wanna talk about action as a way that we can help strengthen our kids' mental health around this. But saying to your child, yeah, that's a great point. I would also not have known what to say. I'm gonna go research myself. Like, do you wanna look with me and see if we can find a source we both think is trustworthy to find out more about what happened at that hospital in Gaza yesterday or whatever the thing is that your kid is like, this thing. You don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to be the guide in terms of Middle East expertise. You're the guide in your child's growth and development. And you're an expert in your kid. And if your kid asks, you know, if you say, what do you want to do next? And they say, well, what would you do? Is that the moment where it's okay to say what you would do? It often is. Listen, a lot of parents, and I I train a lot of staff at overnight camps, and a question that every teenage camper who really enjoys their counselor likes to ask is, well, how old were you, Drew, when you had your first this or that or whatever? Mm -hmm. And I always encourage the counselors to not answer that question because I don't want kids, and I don't want my kids, if they say, well, how old were you when you had your first drink? I've said to my kids, hey, I don't want you to make decisions based on what I did do or I didn't do. So you might say, I have an idea of what I would do. I'd rather you figured out what you want to do first because I don't want to unduly put pressure on you or, um, or make you feel any particular kind of way, ashamed or guilty or dumb if we have different answers to this question. Or you might say, I would do this, or you might model and say, I would want to do this and I would probably only do this. Yeah, and I think helping them walk through, right? If they can't tell you what they feel, ask them just what's happening in their body, right? Like that is a way to get at, if they're not able to label those feelings, I think there's also ways to get at what they're feeling or what they're thinking without necessarily you know, them answering that question exactly. Right. And a few people have said, okay, but what if your kid just says, I don't know to all these things. And I would say for the, for the first little while, just believe them. Be like, okay. And then at some point you might ask them if you can do it in a not snarky way. I'm trying to think of how to say this without it coming across as sarcastic. Ask them, what do you know? And they might just say, I hate talking about this, but that's something they feel. Be like, yeah, I hear that. That for me as a therapist, right? Then I go, well, tell me more about that. (laughs) But I don't know that that would get the best response from your kid. I know this isn't a verb, but therapizing our kids really sometimes frustrates the heck out of them. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. So I know we are beginning to run short on time and I do want to get to our- um, More questions. Well, our college campuses, right? I want to get to the questions about, you know, How do you explain to teens who are both approaching college what is going on, but also, you know, what do we, what do we tell kids who are really anxious and scared about these pro-Palestinian or anti-Israel rallies that are taking place in their backyard and they can't come home, right? They, or feel scared, they feel alone and they can't just, you know, they can't just come home. The first thing I want to say is, I, we can't fix their feelings. First of all, they're probably not wrong to feel terribly uncomfortable, whether that's scared or angry or isolated or whatever it is, their feelings are theirs. The next thing then is help me understand, is this danger or terrible, terrible discomfort? And if you feel you're in danger, what are you willing to do? First of all, what could you do? What resources exist? 
in terms of the provost of this or the you know student affairs of that, or if your kid goes to a school that has any kind of Jewish presence, the Hillel, the Chabad, the I don't even know all the different things there might be. Those are things you could do, not to say you have to, but what are some things you might do if you were walking across campus and it seemed really dangerous to you? All of a sudden, how would you handle that? You know, asking them to talk it through. A lot of times when our kids come to us and say, but what if, and this is just something, you know, Drew, that we use a lot with people who are experiencing yeah. anxiety. I'm not diagnosing anyone. This is a reasonable thing to feel anxious about. So you're experiencing an anxiety. Instead of telling somebody how you feel, how to feel, there's nothing to be worried about. That's it. You say, okay, tell me what if that did happen? Well, what if, you know, I'm, it's the, that's in the quad and it's outside a class. And what if I'm supposed to leave my class and that, that rally's getting really rowdy? Be like, tell them, it's a really good question. What might you do? And you take them down the road. Instead of trying to tell them, oh, you, that's not a thing. Say, yeah, I mean, I don't know how likely that is, but I'm really curious. Tell me, what would you do? Well, and then what if this happened? Tell me, what if that happened? What are some of the, what are the options? You're an expert in your school and I'm not. What are the options? And if they're like, I don't know then it's really good idea. And I, I use a lot with my teens and young adults is to say, can I help you most with empathy, advice, or intervention? Empathy, advice, or intervention. Whenever our kids bring us a problem and anti-Semitism is a big problem, say, I'm so grateful you're bringing this to me. Do you feel like you're mostly here before we talk about it? Just level set for me. Do you feel like you're mostly coming to me for empathy, advice, or intervention? Usually our kids know what they want. And what I find with my own kids is that they usually say empathy. So do adults, by the way, in research when we ask that question. But that if I can do that, if I can only give empathy and keep my mouth shut with my suggestions and sit on my hands and duct tape my face and not intervene, about half the time they swing back around and say, what advice would you have? But we build trust by only giving empathy if that's all they said they wanted. So it's interesting. I haven't heard empathy advice or intervention before. What I have heard is, you know, do you want to vent or do you want to problem solve? Um, and I think it's it's interesting breaking it down in that way. Do you want me to support you? Do you want me, right? Like, do you want me to be here? Just Just be just be that receptacle. I can hold these correct. With you, right. Do you want me to give advice on what I would do? Just in sometimes this perspective, right? I think maybe it was this, or you could see it from your roommate's point of view that way, or right. some things you could do are these things. Mm -hmm. Or do you want me to help step in? Right. Okay. Do you do you need me in this moment to call the provost? Do you need me right. to right? Call the school. I think about, there was one question about um, a teacher who in a high school who was using, you know, this platform and a student didn't feel safe speaking up or speaking out. Um, and so, you know, do you need me to step in and maybe make that call for you in this moment? Um, what other, you know, how might you suggest talking to teens who are looking at college campuses right now in the U.S. or who maybe don't even feel safe in their progressive schools? So two different questions uh, because, and I'm living the, the first one, which is like, what do you tell kids about who are looking at schools? And for that, I would simply ask that you ask them to add a couple of questions to the questions they're going to ask current students however they reach out to those current students. Because what I perceive a university campus to be like is first of all, probably false and definitely suspect from my kid's point of view, because I'm looking through my lens. So if you can say, look, I don't know if you'll use this information when we're making a decision, but could you please ask what the internship programs are like, but also how does it feel to be Jewish on campus? <laughs> right? So, or, you know, did this person go Greek? And also was there anti-Semitism? And so ask them to just gather information, not to make a decision about it. And that's for our high, high school juniors and seniors. For our college students who are feeling unsafe or feeling uncomfortable in progressive circles or in situations where there's maybe just one teacher, like the teacher at Stanford who made all the Jewish students sit in the corner during a class on last Monday and said, um, 
so that you can feel what it's like that what Israel's done to the Palestinians. Every one of these opportunities is for them to figure out who they mean to be in the face of what's happening to them. And I don't mean in the global sense, I mean in that moment, remind them that even in the face of a change we hate, the best skill we can have is to figure out what's my goal in this situation. And it might be to just get out and get back to my dorm, right? It might be to just deal with it until I can process it later. It might be to walk away. It might be to stay quiet. It might be to whatever it is. The hardest thing for us as parents is to not ask these questions as if there's only one right answer. But what we're teaching our kids is not what to do in that moment. It's how to handle those kind of moments. Well, I thank you, Dr. G, for being with us tonight, for helping us to figure out how we help ourselves and how we help our kids in these moments, um, you know, and and throughout whatever comes next. I, I am greatly appreciative to, to get to speak and learn with you. Um, and, you know, I... I, I know that none of this has been easy for anyone. And, you know, we, we hope and pray for, for better days ahead. Absolutely. I put my Instagram handle in the chat. If anybody wants to reach out to me there, I'll try and get back to you um, within just a day or two. And uh, what day is it? Is it Wednesday? Is it like too easy, too early to say Shabbat Shalom? I, <laughs> I think we could all use a little Shabbat Shalom. I think that's totally fine. Um, our shalom and our Shabbats, <laughs> right? For sure. Yeah. Hey, so... The biggest thing I would say is our kids are engaged in this and just by asking them questions with authenticity and curiosity, we will strengthen our relationships with them. Thank you. And Kim, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Dr. G and thank you, Drew. We could be here for days, hours, days, weeks. There's so much and I'll take what you said, Dr. G who our kids need to be, but also who we as parents need to be in the face of what's happening to us. And you gave us so much to think about, whether we act as a consultant, whether we act as a master questioner, um, however we may show gratitude, whatever we can do to show curiosity, because we can't be curious and judgmental at the same time, and our kids can feel that. So I really greatly appreciate what you have done to help us support our Jewish teens on their Jewish journey, um, on their quest for identity, on their quest for legitimacy, because we now have teens who have lived through a, a global pandemic and who have lived through a war in their homeland. Um, and like you said, we are all related to 7 million Jews in Israel. We are all related to 12 million or whatever the number of Jews in the universe. And, and these kids um, rise into their future with all of this burden. So we thank you so much for, for what you have done. Just a few quick announcements for all of you. Um, for the staff, the staff members at BBYO are available. Advisors, Drew, and other mental health professionals are always here for your teens. And I have to say from pandemic forward, and even now for my alum, alumnus, um, BBYO has been there in this most crucial time. And so it's an organization more than just developing our teams, teens, but contributing to our family systems, our family wellness. So please reach out and Carly's gonna put that link in the, um, in the chat. We, Stacy and I, are so grateful that you all joined us here on what we call the, the Parents Council for BBYO, and we are here to partner with you. You all asked a lot of questions about colleges. That was our original topic for tonight. We will bring that back, and we will do what we can to integrate some of your questions from tonight into that. How might um, we just not be academic about it, but teach our teens to, to question how they find their Jewish home in their new campuses as well. So we'll look into that. All of these will be recorded. There are past recordings from parent council programs. These have been so valuable to parents in different areas. So please share with your, your family friends and your kids BBYO friends, um, that BBYO is here to serve all of us, not just uh, not just our teens. Um, look out for emails. They'll be coming on what's next and what's available. And both Stacy and I are available if you want to talk about how to get engaged 
as a parent, we'd love to see you get engaged locally, getting, you know, host your kids um, at events, but also to get in, engaged in the way we have globally. It's it's not um, strictly a financial aspect. Uh, it's looking time, treasure, talent. How do we make sure that we are in service to the greater good of these teens? And so we're also open to your ideas on other programs you'd like to see. And with that, we'll wrap up for tonight. We encourage you to reach out to any of us um, and utilize this amazing resource to help your teen's journey in the way we all hope they do. Um, Dr. G, again, thank you so much. Carly, Drew, all of you at BBYO, we're so grateful that you bring us the resources that let us rise as parents. So thank you. Thank you.